everyone. Come on, hello. Yes. Well, how's everyone doing today? Here we go. Yeah, good. Are you good? How good is everyone? How's everyone doing today? Woo! Okay, just want to check it out. Um, I'm Matt Scott. My pronouns are he, him. I'm the director of storytelling and engagement at the global nonprofit Climate Solutions Resource Project Drawdown. One of our co moderators for today. Hi, everyone. My name is Kiana Kazemi. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an environmentalist, storyteller, and data scientist, and I work across sectors to create climate justice solutions. And I'm so excited to be here with Imagine 5 today to highlight the importance of storytelling in both imagining and also creating a more just and sustainable future. Ooh, and we are just so thrilled to be here in this space, especially as a panel of people of color, which is not, you don't see Woo! often <laughs> in spaces like this. Um, and so we're here with you for about the next 45 minutes. If you have any questions, scan the QR code and we'll get around to those as we go along. Um, but I think we should dive into it and give you a chance to get to know our phenomenal panel of climate heroes. Let's do it. So I would love for you all to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about your environmental origin stories. What was it that got you into this movement, got you to start doing this work, um, and maybe some of those core memories with nature or people in your life that inspired you to want to do this work? Nelson, I'll get you to start us off. Hey, uh, my name is Nelson Zepikeno. I'm the founder of an organization called Black Men with Gardens, uh, which seeks to highlight the narrative of black men connecting to nature through agriculture and uh, creativity. Uh, for me, my journey has been about feeling like I'm a part of the environment, feeling like I'm a part of nature and uh, encouraging other men, boys, fathers, sons, uncles to also reconnect with nature and uh, again, feel like they're a part of it, and by doing that, encourage them to take more stewardship over. There we go. Love that, Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Aditi Meyer, and I'm a visual storyteller and climate activist who explores the intersections of style, sustainability, and social justice. So all things fashion, basically. Um, I had my start in this space 10 years ago when I learned about a factory collapse in Bangladesh. Um, it is one of the biggest industrial disasters of our time, and that factory collapse got me thinking about the politics of labor in the fashion industry. So my origins in the space was around labor organizing within the garment worker movement, and really looking at the ills of our dominant fashion model, um, whether that was the social or the environmental. As time went on, I got very much interested in the solutions-oriented part of the space. So what does the alternative actually look like? Um, so from there, storytelling became a really critical tool. I spent last year in India um, as a National Geographic Fellow documenting fashion through the lens of farmers and artisans. So trying to understand the industry through everything from regenerative agriculture to decentralized approaches that really hone in on ancestral knowledge around the world. And really honored to be here. Wonderful. Thank you. So my name is Clara Kitongo. I am a program manager at Tree Pittsburgh, but I'm a musician as well. I'm a scientist and an artist, I feel like. Um, I grew up in Uganda and moved to Pittsburgh in 2008 to do my education and just stayed there. Uh, but I, when I was in Uganda, I was in an all girls Christian high school and uh, it was out in the countryside and we would spend a lot of time taking care of the land and just really taking responsibility for the space. So I was growing up, at, uh, taking care of things that I love was part of my own experience. And then coming to the US, I always, um, you know, social issues were really of importance to me, but I felt like the environment was one place that no matter what you, your color is, no matter where you're from, we're all gonna be affected by how the environment presents. And, it was the only way I felt like I could connect into an issue that actually taps and connects multiple threads. So um, I, along my education journey, learned about Wangari Maathai, and I'm sure some of you in this room know Wangari, and she started the Green Belt Movement, but also was a, um, in Pittsburgh. She did her PhD in Pittsburgh. I was very moved by how she used um, the grassroots movement with the, the, the women in her village to really use their voice to 
push development that was going to cut down trees in a, in a park in Nairobi. And that story really moved my life. And I was like, well, I think I want to go back into working with the environment. So that's how I started doing this. Wangari called me, called me forth, and I was like, I'll respond. <laughs> um, and currently, I work in Pittsburgh helping communities develop greening plans and centering their voices versus having um, you know, groups just coming in and deciding what plans they need to implement in communities. So I really enjoy engaging frontline with uh, folks in communities. So that's my story. Well, hello everyone. My name is Josna Harris. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the founder of Change Narrative, which is an organization building capacity in the climate justice movement through the power of our stories. And so I work with people to craft narratives to use them as a tool to build confidence, but also as a way to advocate for solutions. Um, and I'm also a mother of two um, teenagers, 18 year old and a 16 year old, and I've been married for 22 years. I like people's reactions when I say that because we're not always what, um, what we seem, and I think that's why storytelling is so important, so we can understand different parts of us. My um, environmental origin story, like many of us, begins way before me, um, and my grandmother uh, was a farmer in rural India and was also um, involved with um, hand, hand looming. Um, and um, these are parts of my own story that I actually didn't know about until just a few years ago, but that, um, you know, when it, we learn about different parts of our own histories, we learn about ourselves and our own path. And I've been farming for the last eight years, so it's very meaningful to me to find out some of these stories. Um, but my grandmother actually abruptly stopped farming when there was a tragedy in our family in India and moved away from that um, and didn't actually talk about it at all and, um, and, and really reinvented herself. And my dad came to uh, the United States in 1969, which was also the year that Apollo landed on the moon. And so for him, that really represented the possibilities of America, that of promise and opportunity, which ac actually has really been uh, very true for our family. And I've been working in the climate change movement um, for the last 10 years. And over that time, I really realized that just a small group of highly influential individuals really shape and control the narrative in the mainstream. And, um, and that's really not representative of the spirit of democracy of this country, and that all of us um, should feel a sense of belonging. Um, I know I was raised with you know, knowing my worth and my value, but also that we should assimilate to be successful, and it's really taken me years to unpack that and to realize that we all need to stand in our own unique identity and be proud of who we are and really step into that because that is our strength and our superpower. And so um, that's really why I do the work that I do. Wow. Beautiful. Diana, want to go for it and share your, your story? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I was born and raised in Iran um, and I lived there until I was eight years old. And uh, my mom's side of the family is from Shiraz. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Shiraz wine, but that describes people from Shiraz pretty well. They're pretty laid back. Um, they're a lot of the greatest poets from Iran or Persia come from Shiraz. And so it has this deep history of connecting with nature, resting, rejuvenating, and creating resilience out of our relationship with nature. And so growing up in Iran, uh, I traveled all over the country with my grandparents uh, between the ages of, you know, pretty much as soon as I was born all the way until I was eight years old. And we would go visit the red sand beaches and we would drive through the desert, go through the mountains, and there's so much beautiful diversity of nature in Iran. And when I was eight years old, my family moved to New Zealand, which is another beautiful, gorgeous country. But it was the first time that I learned that my relationship to nature, to the earth, was deeply connected with culture, deeply connected with language, spirituality. Often these terms and ideas that we don't really connect with the idea of nature or environmentalism. And so when I moved to the US when I was 16 and learned about the idea of environmental justice, that was the first time that it clicked for me that all of these different frameworks and ideas could exist together 
and actually make us better environmentalists, make us be more aware of how we can make an impact on this earth. And so that is a big part of my environmental origin story and uh, drives the work that I do today. Um, and speaking of culture, I would love to ask you all a little bit about um, you know, how culture has played a significant role in the work that you all do. Um, Matt, do you want to maybe tell us a little bit about your story? Sure, and I think a huge part of it, it's so interesting how we start out with this question because when I listen to everyone's responses, um, you all know like I, I interview folks as part of my work at Project Drawdown through our Drawdowns Neighborhood series, which you two are featured in, but um, so much of the stories that we've told and the culture that we've presented around climate, I have found that I didn't connect to for a long time. I didn't grow up with a sense or an identity that I was someone who had, you know, who, who was an environmentalist or in this climate world. And I think one of the reasons for that, again, is the story we tell and the culture we shape around this. And so just even tying in my story with this, you know, a huge reason that I'm here and doing this work and the center of the work that, um, that I do is passing the mic to those that often go unheard and centering underrepresented communities and voices because for a long time I did not connect with the culture of the environmental space. I didn't connect with the stories that were being told. And you know, when you can't connect, when you don't see yourself represented, you, know, you, you don't enter those spaces. I'll, I'll, I'll even admit with Climate Week NYC, one of the things that I struggle with sometimes is the weight of being one of you people on literally this stage, stages like this, um, because more people need to be up here. More of us need to see ourselves represented and in this space. Um, but I'll say when it comes to you know, my story to tie that in before kind of handing it to others to talk about culture, um, I'm so motivated by the story of my dad who passed away in 2017. Shout out to my mom who's here too, Dr. Melody Toby, supporting me from the front row. Um, <laughs> But I think of my story, the story of my dad who grew up in a place called Prince Edward County, Virginia, um, a place where during the Civil Rights era, black students had their school with less resources and white students had their school with better resources. And when schools were forced to integrate because of the law, they decided that that wasn't gonna be the case. And so for about five years, students in Prince Edward County were left without the opportunity to have an education. They didn't have access to school, which is insane. And so when I think about the culture I want to shape, I want it to be one where people's stories and stories like that aren't overlooked, where they're heard, heard where they're represented, and where people feel like, regardless of where they come from, regardless of what they're wearing or how they show up, that they belong, um, a come-as-you-are approach, which I think is something that you know, I wish we all could look in the mirror and um, learn to embrace. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Aditi, I know that culture plays a big part of the work that you do as well. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that work and why you started to kind of bring in that element into the sustainability and fashion work that you do? Yeah, definitely. So to your point about not feeling represented by a movement, um, when I got involved with the sustainable fashion movement about 10 years ago, the platitude that you would hear time and time again is vote with your dollar. And that is important. I think there is an important space for conscious consumerism. But what that statement, I think, underpinned was those that could involve themselves with sustainable fashion needed to have the ability of buying power. Mm -hmm. So purchasing power is what kind of framed our involvement in this space. And as someone that came from a low-income immigrant household, that really wasn't the case to make price point and buying a way to engage with the movement. And I started to think about the ways that sustainability was ingrained into my family and my life growing up, um, not as something that we bought, but something we embodied. It was a mindset and a lifestyle. When we think about sustainability from the lens of reusing resources, passing things down, mending things. I thought about my grandfather with his you know, tote bag of 30 years and the outfit he's been wearing for the last decade. And I'm like, that is a sustainable fashion icon. <laughs> um, so it got me thinking about the ways that we really needed to contextualize sustainability and sustainable fashion in different contexts. Um, it got me thinking a lot about the role of fashion in India. And so a lot of my work um, is looking at the history of colonization in India, which was largely tied to fashion. 
Um, it was largely an empire of cotton. And so I wanted to understand how colonization was tied to this mentality of extraction of the land, of people, and that really frames our dominant fashion model today as well. We talk about fast fashion as this phenomenon that began in the 90s to talk about Zara's like 15 day turnaround time, but I kind of took it back to historical movements and whether it was the transatlantic slave trade or again, colonization in India, it was tied to cotton production. Um, so as far as what that looks like, India had a super rich fashion model um, prior to colonization where different areas throughout India had specific bioregions, specific fibers that were growing textiles, and the relationship to the land and agriculture was deeply tied to fashion. So farmers were feeding artisans fibers that would then inform a decentralized fashion model, and it really painted this portrait of a diverse fashion model that can empower local communities in a local context. So that's what a lot of my work is about today, is kind of reviving those artisan clusters that still exist. Um, and it allows me to reflect on this idea of diversity deeply. You know, it's 2023 and we often talk about diversity being this cosmetic solution, but I think diversity is literally tied to modalities of sustainability. There are concrete knowledge systems tied to cultures around the world. And I think that when it comes to climate justice, there's not gonna be a one size fits all solution. And so I think that culture underpins understanding worldviews that inform how we engage with the world. And I think that is the future of sustainability is every one of you here has a culture and identity. And it's all gonna look a bit different, but honing in on that really allows us to inform our work in this space from an emotional heart-centered space Space, which I think is critical because if this work was about shocking statistics to make us act, we would have acted a long time ago. So I think that identity-centered place is really, really important. Yeah, as a data scientist, I can admit that those numbers aren't going to convince people and it's really that storytelling that will get people to change their behaviors, change the narrative, um, and change the culture of what it is that we want to do. Um, Nelson, you're a storyteller. Yeah. Um, and I am so deeply inspired by the work that you have been doing with Black Men with Gardens. Uh, Imagine Five recently did this beautiful piece on the work that you do following you around for 48 hours, which we had a lot of fun doing. Um, so yeah, tell us a little bit more about your work, um, culture and representation, and, and why it's so important. Mm, gotcha. Um, yeah, no, culture specifically is the one thing that keeps was keeping me and a lot of people that look like me out of these spaces. Yeah. Um, at the core, we have to take a certain, a, a set of responsibility to realize that in our culture specifically, it wasn't encouraged for us to be in nature. And uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, traumatic history of our forced tutelage in fields or uh, inability to set or inability to have access to these natural spaces. And um, as a result, a lot of our culture now is based off of other things. And it's up to us as storytellers to infuse in our culture and our traditions and our values that um, the environment is part of it. Um, you know, it's more likely for me growing up to think that I could be a NBA player <laughs> than I could be a, you know, climate justice warrior or, uh, you know, in my culture specifically and working with gardens and plants, it's kind of looked down on for me as a black male to work with flowers, mm -hmm. specifically in my culture. That's something that needs to be challenged and the very act, again, of showcasing and telling these stories of men that do work with flowers, men that do take care of the environment, men that are interested in, you know, our climate and um, our future. By telling those stories, we're getting the younger generations more interested in these type of challenges or taking on these type of challenges, but then also um, encouraging them to, you know, also be a part of the solution. Yeah, you know, one thing, so much of what you said obviously connects to me as a black man, and I think that it also points out that there are so many dynamics that we have to navigate 
uh, from our various identities beyond just the climate crisis, beyond just dealing with what people who are in the majority deal with. We have to deal with all of these cultural stigmas and then the stereotypes and the biases and the microaggressions that we face when we decide to do these things. Exactly. But I, I also love talking about storytelling and the power of representation. And I, I want to go to you, Josna, um, because I think of something that I've heard you say many times about how the stories from frontline communities are often missing from the conversation, but tie in with just solutions. Like our stories aren't just feel good, inspirational, warming hearts, but they actually matter in us doing something and ending this crisis, which we want to end desperately. And so I just wanted to see um, your thoughts on this question about representation and culture and stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when I, I think about the broader picture of culture in our society, it is that sort of undercurrent of social fabric um, that um, tells us how we should be. And um, especially in mainstream climate communications, it has been a very exclusive place because it has typically not included um, black people, indigenous people, communities of color, people who identify as LGBTQIA+, um, youth, elders, people with disabilities, um, but really um, people who are experiencing not only a disproportionate burden of the impacts, but who have a proximity and a perspective to the issues that um, really are, t their stories, our stories um, are the essential testimonies that are needed so that we can understand how to incorporate justice into the solutions that we're seeking. Because we will not achieve a just transition if we draw down our emissions alone and lose out and, and miss the justice aspect of it. So when we are all in spaces, I feel that we, we have a responsibility to shift the narrative um, and include parts of the conversation that are typically missing which are emotion and identity and vulnerability because that's what connects us as humans. Um, I, early in my career, um, was responsible for coordinating all of these forums across rural Minnesota. And in that experience, I listened to um, mostly scientists, um, which it, it were sharing really critical and valuable information. But I found myself listening to presentation after presentation and um, seeing the scatter plots and the graphs and feeling a complete disconnect of how this actually applied to my life and where I might fit into that picture. And so um, storytelling is really a very important strategy for normalizing the climate conversation and has everything to do with shifting our culture on climate. Uh, and really any social movement that I can think of has always included the power of narrative. Mm -hmm. Um, as like the, the underbed of it. And when I think about um, social movements, I think about the stories. Those are the things that are memorable to me and that we're literally, all of us, building what this moment means by sharing our stories because they bring the data to life and they place it in, into context and create a relevance for why it matters. So um, that is why um, culture, shaping and shifting it, looking at Hollywood, how screenwriters, producers, directors, murals, music, art, is all such an important part of this conversation that's often on the sidelines and missing, but that's what shapes culture. Yeah, I, I wanna like point to you, Claire, and I think you were about to jump in, but you meld like the, so much of what we're talking about together as a musician, but also as someone who's worked with kids, with young people, we have a question about like how um, to engage young people when it comes to some of this work. Um, but also as a tree equity manager at Tree Pittsburgh, like there, there's so much that ties in. And so just curious to hear your thoughts on this culture representation yes. question. I, I feel, especially coming from a different culture and then being in Pittsburgh working with community, what I'm learning in terms of bringing voices and culture into the conversation is I have to humble myself, we have to humble ourselves when we're doing this work because um, you know, the conversations that have been had because people have not been in the room are actually, it's possible to go in with a bias. So what I've learned through my experience is not assuming that I know what the solutions are, but listening. And so just like, like this week I was in a, 
a community meeting with like some elders and they're in a, like a, a home, not quite a nursing home, but they are the women who want to care for the community. They want to save the young kids' lives. And we're talking about bringing more trees. Where should we put these trees? And then they all, one woman was like, I remember when I was young and we would run up this hill and we knew where the fruit was and we'd have to make a code word and say uncle because the police was coming, you know, mm -hmm. Uncle Sam is watching. <laughs> and I was like, you know, and then so that we could see the rain coming and you could smell that rain. And I was like, wow, this story makes me want to plant more trees. But it was just listening that I'm not coming with solutions for this women, they already know, they've lived, and they have ways that they want to express. So a big thing that I've learned as an equity manager that I continue to, to, you know, open space for folks to share their story, not assume that I know what their culture is because I'm coming from a completely different culture. But also then how could I use that very story that she said to tap into her grandkids and tap into other pe people that she's connected to in the community and we're gonna do a big community party and they wanna have some artists there. But you know, what point would it be for me to come with you know, 30 trees and nobody from the community involved while you know, this woman sharing her story and rem remembering, oh, I do love trees and I used to play with fruit as a kid brought that whole story to life. So, um, and with children, that's a more complicated one because I'm not a child. But <laughs> I used to be a child. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> but, you know, with kids, it's very interesting how they, how they connect with what you're sharing. And sometimes something as easy as just, you know, let's play with this dirt. The stories that come out of a child's life are so different. Like, I did a tree planting in a community in Pittsburgh, and at the end, this little girl was like, I want to grow a forest when I grow up. A black girl, who I'm sure I was the first black woman planting trees mm -hmm. with her in the community. And that moved me to see, you know, tapping, right, go to the, where the community culture is being created, bring yourself with humility, and then allow those, vo those stories to help you start waving, I mean, creating new waves of uh, change in there. So I hope that answers that's, that question. That's powerful. And yeah. we thank you, everyone, who submitted questions. Yeah. We have. Uh, a few more than we were able to get to today, but I think part of what you touched on is that there is power even in just sh showing up and being the representation so that someone sees that they can be, you know, that type of person who is wearing the cape, tapping into their superpower as a climate solutions hero. And, you know, we miss so many opportunities at times as organizations, but as individuals. Um, even just accidentally by not representing so many perspectives and identities. But I want to actually ask a question based on one of the ones we received here, which is like, what advice do, do any of you have for like organizations as they highlight these stories, not just stories about climate solutions, but stories that center um, the communities that are one, most vulnerable to the impacts of climate and also go unheard. I'm, I'm so curious if um, anyone has anything they want to share, advice for folks in the room. I'll share something. Mm. Um, just kind of also touching on the other question about how do you um, teach the younger generation, a lot of it comes down to interacting. Mm. Um, just doing something that's interactive and um, exposure. So tying those two things together, the main thing is to expose the people to the thing that you want to teach them about in an interactive way that allows them to feel a part of it, to get their hands. For me, it's about letting them get their hands in the dirt, put their hands around plants, work with nature, be out in nature, hug a tree. Um, and just by doing that, you start, to, um, you start to foster that sense of curiosity within them that naturally is going to help them become a part of this and become a part of the solution. Um, it's a great way to teach. Again, for me, I learned through the ability to use my hands and to work with something that's, you know, as opposed to being told the data, as opposed to being told how things work and being given the set uh, list of instructions, you allow people to interact with the very thing that you want them to um, learn about and you, you allow them to learn about it organically because a lot of the times, um, and a lot of these co different affected communities, that is the main way that they, they will learn. And um, again, that's why storytelling is so great because it's a great way of indirectly teaching something to someone. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the you know, values and beliefs that I had growing up were taught to me through stories in some form. 
and, um, and they, become, they become a core value inside, but are received through, again, this uh, narrative that sometimes you know, isn't necessarily based on just the data or the, you know, on the data or the science, but uh, based again on experience and, uh, and, and shared through that, you know, experience. Yeah. yeah. I love that you both work with young kids and youth because we're seeing a lot of statistics these days around young people facing mass numbers of eco-anxiety and feeling overwhelmed by the pressures of the climate crisis and what that means for their futures. It's a crisis that you know, no young generation has faced before. And so we're seeing more and more uh, media start to pop up and stories start to pop up that are very climate solution oriented. Um, because the mainstream media for such a long time has highlighted climate doom and gloom. You know, there are countless documentaries on um, different cities being de demolished by climate disasters. And that's heartbreaking, and it's important to raise awareness around those issues, but I think it's also so important that we talk about the solutions that exist out there and the frontline communities that are really doing that solutions-oriented work. So, Aditi, I know you exist on the online space um, and also interact with a lot of young people. So how do you kind of incorporate solutions-oriented thinking into your work um, and try to spread that climate optimism on your social media platforms? Yeah, I really like the idea of the Trojan horse approach, and I think that's why fashion has become such a fun vehicle for me to look at climate action, um, because it's you know a medium we all engage with every day, but it's also tied to a lot of problematic ideas when we think of this false idea of aspiration, of like the fashion influencer that never wears the same thing twice, and it's kind of encouraging mindless consumption all the time. So the ways that I try to kind of challenge that through my own platform is, again, tied to this idea as sustainability as a lifestyle that you embody. Um, that is content that champions content around personal style and making things personal to your own aesthetic and culture. Um, it's content that explores upcycling and mending the things that we already have and using the resources at our disposal. It's also about tying industries like fashion that is very much tied to the glitz, the glamour, the attention economy with the most important fights of our time, be it the ties between fashion and fossil fuel um, to the ties between fashion and labor justice. I think contextualizing an industry with the larger picture is really, really important, but again, visual storytelling and the visual culture of fashion becomes like a very accessible medium for someone scrolling through Instagram to start thinking mm -hmm. about these things. And I think there's great power in that. Um, and I think it goes back into this idea of diversity and speaking to what mediums you're naturally drawn to. Because the idea of a climate activist can be quite narrow, um, and who embodies that, right? But we need every single industry to speak on this in their own way. And to your other question about actionable items for folks that come from organizational settings, um, the UN released a really great fashion communications playbook. I was just on a panel yesterday where they were talking more about this at the UN, about how brands can kind of champion storytelling around fashion with climate change in mind. So it's rooted in storytelling that is about science and data that is accurate, but also pivoting Again, mindless consumption. So I encourage everyone to check out that playbook called the UNEP Fashion Communications Playbook. Yeah, one, one thing that this all reminds me of is uh, just thinking about the role that each and every person has here. And I'll just like vent to folks that uh, I'm so thankful to be able to do the work I do at Project Drawdown. I'm so thankful to be in spaces where people invite us in to share uh, to share the work that we're doing. And, but I also feel like at times when we're talking about this conversation and what organizations could do that, and what communities could do that so many people overlook their role. Like I know that once, I fear that once we leave here today that there'll be people thinking, oh, that was nice, they did a good job, they're doing so well. But one thing that I was talking about yesterday in another session was just how especially when it comes to justice, when it comes to equity, when it comes to rights and fighting for rights. Like I mentioned my dad's story and that community fighting for education, which is such a basic human right that we don't wanna have to be doing this work and representing. We want 
for us to have equity, to have inclusion, to have diversity in these spaces, and yet we still have to keep crying out. Um, and one of the things that I would love to see from more communities is inviting, like inviting us in to connect with your community, to bring in our stories. There's a question here about um, just doom and gloom and how to address that, and I think one of the ways that, you know, we can address doom and gloom is to show that, like, yes, there's a lot of weight that we carry coming into these spaces. There are a lot of um, traumas and other things that we navigate, and it's difficult. But at the same time, each and every person here is working on solutions, is working on building a better world. That's something to be celebrated. And I, I, I love that when it comes to the superpowers from each of our communities, and from underrepresented communities in particular, that there is this balance of, like, yes, there's so much that we go through and have been through to put a smile on our face and get out of bed in the morning and to do what we're doing, but also there's so much power that we're tapping into, and I think so many others, um, particularly from white communities in the climate world, could learn a lot from that resilience and that ability to show up. And I just want to thank you all for being here as part of this, um, just because like this is so much easier to not do alone. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if, I, if anyone has, yeah. Yeah, I want to add a little piece about what folks could do. I think um, not being, it would be great if the organizations are uplifting the folks in the community. So it's not like the CEO who is going to give the, imagine they show up with the, that lady that I just talked about, you know, that community voice. Like once we can not take the credit for the work that they're doing and actually center their, their voices, I feel like that will start shifting and humanizing these communities, you know. Um, I really loved the panel yesterday from some of the drawdown folks from, New, from the tri-state area. They were mentioning, you know, pay these folks. Don't just come and extract information, or oh, let's read these data points, but like, how do you then, you know, I'm gonna pay you for doing this work, and then I'm gonna uplift you and put you on the stage with me, and I'm, you know, just, I'll, I'll, not that our organization is doing this great work, but these are the human beings behind the work that we're doing, so. That's just something I wanted to add to this conversation. Mm -hmm. I'd love to add a little bit of data to that as well because there's been some really great research that's been done around funding and environmental justice efforts. And out of the billions of dollars that get donated to climate change uh, you know, organizations and movements every year, less than 2% of that goes to environmental justice-led organizations. And even less than that goes to women of color-led environmental justice organizations. So just think about the work that these organizations are already doing and what they could be doing with a little bit more resources. So if you're a part of large organizations, that has a lot of power. Hire these orgs to work with you, bring them in, and start to really develop that relationship with the communities that you're working in. I think it's really important to do that. Yeah, and just to comment on that, I know we're, we're uh, running up on time uh, as we wrap up this panel, but one thing I just want to say to underscore that point is, I feel like so many of us, especially when you're from the communities that are first and worst impacted and most vulnerable to the climate crisis, like, we are fighting to survive. This, this is life or death. And sometimes, I was having this conversation with one of my teammates, Drew Arietta, who's phenomenal, um, that sometimes it feels like a party and everyone's celebrating, but this is people, us fighting for ourselves, for our communities who are dying now, today, but also fighting for the benefits that we're seeing each and every day through the work that we're doing. And so when people wonder if it's worth doing this work, if it's worth telling these stories when it comes to climate, the reality is we're seeing people actually benefiting, having improved lives today. Um, and this is necessary. The including underrepresented communities is necessary and something we need to do. It's not a question of how or if for us, and I hope the same goes for each and every one of you and that you could look in the mirror and see, I am actually passing the mic and putting these voices and stories and superpowers front and center because so often our voices, our stories, our powers aren't valued. But um, I want to kind of pivot to the last question we have, which is just about um, a story that 
you know, each of us would want folks to share as we go beyond this panel. For me, um, it is in part your stories, Clara and Josna, through Drawdown's neighborhood. Check it out at drawdown.org slash neighborhood. Uh, but also, I, I'm just so curious, like, what it is that you'd want folks to do and share, maybe starting with you, Josta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, I think about the role that imposter syndrome plays in this movement, and um, some of the things that have really stuck with me is when I am on stage and then somebody will come up to me afterwards and say, it means the world to me to see somebody like you leading in this conversation. And that really sticks with me because I, I, a lot of times we're told that we don't belong and that many of us feel like imposters because we don't have enough information or we are not the experts, but all of us have expertise in our lived experience. And I've been struggling too with like how to be humble and also shine your light so that others can see their light. And it is like a fine balance and um, many of our cultures are, you know, we should not speak up. We should not be loud, especially as women. So um, how, how do you live that and let it shine so that other people can see themselves? So those stories really stick with me. Yeah, and on Nelson, if you want to go. Translator, yeah. Throwing it out there. If you have a story. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a story that I'd like to share, um, just to kind of give some perspective to a little bit about what I was saying earlier about accessibility, essentially. Um, several years ago, there was a seven-year-old boy who on his way to school one morning, on his way to the bus stop, decided to pick a tulip that he was gonna take home to his mother. Um, after he picked that tulip, shortly afterwards, the police came and arrested him. And this little boy went to jail, seven-year-old boy, seven-year-old black boy, went to jail for picking a tulip because it happened to be in his neighbor's yard. His neighbor didn't like the fact that this kid picked a tulip. And um, through the tr he had to go to trial and everything like that, and uh, ultimately the case was thrown out, fortunately. Um, but I want that to speak to a little, uh, I want that to speak to, again, that lack of inability to feel a part of nature, to feel a part of the environment. And I want you to think about the impact that has on a community or on a, on a person, on a community, when again, I can't even pick a flower, how could I give a F about the environment in general? Mm -hmm. And um, I want to implore you, if you're in an organization that's in a, that has the ability to invest in these type of communities, um, to ultimately make that investment knowing that by giving people the access to these green spaces, naturally the care for these green spaces is going to arise and that needs to be baked into the solution that, you know, that we have moving forward. And uh, again, sharing these stories um, is gonna help us get a lot of that, a lot more of that type of stuff out. I think that's such a powerful story to end on. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Um, and we have both at Project Drawdown and Imagine 5 done some really incredible storytelling work with all of our amazing panelists today. So check out our work. Yeah. And um, I, I just wanted to, I know we're at time, just transparently we are at time. Sorry, producers of this stuff. <laughs> have this space often, but Clara, I know there's a story that you wanted to share that people would appreciate. Yes, it's and just a quick yes. song. Ready? Thank you. Ready? <laughs> so, here we go. For so long the people have been pressed down. The system got me wondering where to break down. Sun up to sundown, working for my ransom, trying not to feel like I'm a letdown. But moving forward as I sway to the beat, and finding my position as I prepare the heat. Swaying with the rhythm, feeling how I flow. A whole leap of concrete waves are swum through, so straight to the roots we go. Man's elevated, it's love related. Straight to the roots we go. That's it, friends. I want you to go straight to the roots. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.